Welcome to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Follow the ounces, not the prices. He who has the gold rules. And if you don't have the gold, you are ruled. Stacy. Indeed, Max. We're in a time of great wealth transfers. And during these time, of course, it doesn't come easily. There's a lot of financial war. And one of the main ingredients of this financial war is psychological operations, PSYOPs. 412 PSYOPs. This is from Hugo Salinas Price, our friend. We flew to Greece with him, and Greece is in the headline later, but the definition of PSYOP, psychological operations, applies to the events of Friday, April 12th, and Monday, April 15th, 2013, when the price of gold was taken down to 1380. And to get it down to 1380, Max, it took 1,100 tons of paper gold, according to Commerce Bank, which was 45% of annual production of gold. Well, Stacey Herbert, on this show, on many occasions, I have told you, the audience out there around the world, about my concept of price propaganda. Mm. We live in an age of price propaganda. In the old days, back in the last century, propaganda took the form of media propaganda, image propaganda, news propaganda, the age of manufacturing consent, as Noam Chomsky would talk about. This is price propaganda. If you can move the price to a certain uh, level, then people's perception will change based on price. I more or less invented this idea because I invented a technology to change prices to create difference in perception for Hollywood movies, if you recall. Now that idea has been taken to the extremists by these financial terrorists, the gold banks, who are using price propaganda to change people's perception. The underlying value, however, the intrinsic value, however, is increasing, is increasing. Okay, and now everybody calls Ben Bernanke and the ECB and the Bank of England Keynesian or neo-Keynesian, but they are fighting this war against the Austrians and they are doing it intentionally for the Austrians because Austrians would say there is no intrinsic value, there's no such thing because all value comes from human consciousness. It's what humans perceive something as being worth, that's what the worth is. So he says, this is what Hugo Salinas Price, who was a good friend of Mises, by the way, so he is an Austrian school. Following the wikipedia.org definition, the PSYOPs war on gold is intended to influence the target audience's value system, belief system, emotions, motives, reasoning, and behavior. I would add especially this last, which is what directly affects the price of gold. Yeah, well, you know, Austrian school, going back to Karl Menge, is a transition from medieval economics to more of a post-medieval economics. And this idea of value is in the eye of the beholder gives the same connotations as knowledge is in the, the, the it's kind of like know thyself or it's kind of like uh, the, the, I think therefore I am. When it comes to economics, Karl Menge brought this fresh way of thinking that the value is what I think it is. So that's very interesting and very important. So we're going to look at what, how he says the, the most important is behavior. So we're going to look at the behavior around the world and whether or not the Keynesian acting with an Austrian mindset towards their purposes in this gold war, whether they're achieving it. So first we're going to head east where all the gold is flowing. Golden Times per Perth Mint. Then we have a headline, threefold increase in demand for gold. This is in India, and we also see this in Bangkok, Max. They're talking about traffic jams on the sidewalks outside shops, gold bullion shops in Bangkok. They're seeing that in India. They're seeing it three-hour, four-hour waits in uh, Australia. But that's our show. Our show is seen globally, and the idea of keeping gold suppressed is local. It's local to the West Keynesian money printing propaganda wars. But globally, people understand, people, globally, our show is global. They buy gold. <laughs> so, well, where are they to meet, where are these concepts meet, where the uh, psychological war, where the belief in, um, in paper and the mightiness of paper meets in Japan, which is over in Asia, of course, where everybody else is consuming, consuming, and buying. Japanese see gold as hedge against stocks and yen. So we know that the uh, gold price in yen hit an all-time high right before the price crashed. And a lot of people are now lining up seven-hour-long waits outside gold bullion shops in Ginza. 
And a lot of them are doing it because banks pay no interest on their deposits. They're also a fearing war. But some Japanese also harbor fears that the expansionary monetary and fiscal policies known as abenomics, coupled with a national debt more than twice as large as annual economic output, could set off a crisis. It's true. That's why they're buying gold over there. It hit a new all-time high just a couple of weeks ago. That set off the paper bugs avalanche of sales in the paper market. And it'll hit a new all-time high in yen probably in the next two or three weeks. And that'll be another waterfall effect against fiat currencies. So that's the war. It's right there in Japan. Now, the interesting thing about this, of course, is in the years leading up to the global financial crash, it's been Mrs. Watanabe, the investor in America. It, it, Who's Mrs. Watanabe? The investor in Japan who deals with the household finances. And she's been engaged in Forex market trading paper, uh, especially going into Iceland, a krona, for example. So now if they're actually, instead of playing in the paper market, they're playing in the physical Are market. They? This is what the New York Times suggests in this piece. That the Mrs. Watanabe, the, the prototypical marginal buyer or seller in Japan who's been in and out of Forex is now buying physical? Is that what you're saying? If that's true, then gold's going to $10,000 an ounce. If that's true, Stacy, can you categorically state right here that what you just said is not a falsehood? It is unimpeachably correct. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Mrs. Watanabe is buying gold, you savvy little Japanese woman. Well, it would be an important psych in terms of the psychological war, the fact that in it's backfired in this case. Here has been the one of the most um, passionate participants in the, the whole paper bubble that has emerged over the past decade. Yeah, because, okay, Bank of Japan has been artificially lowering interest rates down to zero to give banks on in, in Wall Street a way to borrow money at near zero to speculate for free. Mrs. Watanabe has been, you know, the Japanese housewife has been, who, who, who oversees the Japanese savings, which is the highest in the world. I think we should make that point. They've got a quadrillion in yen of savings that they can, is being dictated by the, the housewives because the, the Japanese men are famously down at the pub drunk off their keister on whiskey. They don't know the difference between a dollar and a football. So uh, Mrs. Watanabe, the Mrs. Japanese housewife is making the decisions. They've been in the paper market. If they go into the physical gold market, it's Good night, Irene, for the central bankers like Ben Bernanke. Ah! <laughs> so let's look over into the West here in Europe, yeah. where there's been massive psychological war that is beating down the people. So let's see what's happening. We'll look at Greece and Ireland. Headline reads, disposable income in Greece fell 8.3% in Q4 of 2012, consumption down 11.2%. So Max, total income is now down, disposable income is down 30% since the crisis began. Savings fell by 5.9% in the fourth quarter. And now 30% of the population of Greece say they, they, it was better for them and they would prefer a junta than the, the <laughs> than democracy. No, well, they, so they, they prefer the junta over the troika. The junta over the troika. The junta didn't try to shuffle them off on railroad cars to concentration camps, did they? They just were a military occupation. The troika is like, oh, let's all incinerate everybody because uh, we can't afford to keep them uh, uh, fed after we stole all their money. And then similarly over in Ireland, not only do you have a horrible wave of suicides, but in terms of the psychological war and what they want is the capitulation and obedience. And you see that in this next story. Irish debtors face ban on vacations, caps on food spending. Irish borrowers struggling to meet their loan repayments may be banned from taking vacations and face limits on how much they can spend on food under guidelines published by the country's personal insolvency service. It's an open air prison in Ireland now. And I think the solution there would be to instigate new economic policies monetizing butter. So the Bank of Ireland would be capitalized by butter because there's a lot of butter in Ireland. It could be a butter-based economy. They would rule the world. It'd be butter dollars. Butter dollars could, bu bu butter coins could replace bitcoins. <laughs> well, monthly, Individual living expenses for people seeking debt relief may be capped at 35.73 euros for clothing, 
and four pence euros for food and 33.40 euros for personal hygiene items. So they have specific numbers. It's very controlled. Um, it is like being a cattle Present. or sheep. People know exactly, you know, the farmer knows exactly how many calories they're going to feed this sheep before it gets sent off to the slaughter. Every single sheep and cattle is very carefully modulated. It's like a, you know, like a big abattoir. They got all these Irish people, they're going to line them up steal all their money, they got to carefully calibrate every piece of their life. <laughs> well, the guidelines they said are set to a standard of living that is based on needs, not wants. So this is the psychology. You have to, they're trying to alter people's perceptions. Your life should be based on your needs, not your wants, the, the, which is the end of capitalism, by the way. That's the junta. That's what the junta would tell you. That's what the totalitarian government would tell you. Your life style that we're willing to give you is based on your needs, not your wants. So <laughs> let's move on to the final headline then, Max. Oh, look, Representative Mike Rogers' wife stands to benefit greatly from CISPA passing. It would appear that Representative Mike Rogers, the main person in Congress pushing for CISPA, has kept rather quiet about a very direct conflict of interest that calls into serious question the entire bill. It would appear that Rogers' wife stands to benefit quite a lot from the passage of CISPA and has helped in the push to get the bill passed. So his wife's name is Christy Clemens Rogers and she was a former CEO of Aegis, a big security firm, and now she's a lobbyist for all these security firms. And these security firms are the defense contractors, are the ones pushing for CISPA, which is the invasion of online privacy. Now it's passed in Congress, just like SOPA passed Congress as well easily, and it's supposed to go to the Senate and to the White House to sign. Um, whether it passes that, is, it's uncertain, but we know this is a psychological war that they'll break us down eventually. They'll keep on using terror attacks and false flags and, and crazy people out on the street who just go crazy one day. Is that Because that guy went crazy, we need to uh, watch everything you do. Well, I've got a new hashtag on Twitter called hashtag America Fatigue. So whether it's the CISPA or somebody getting blown up in Boston, whatever, it's just America Fatigue. It's a country in decline. It's less than 4% of the global GDP. They produce 25% of the global garbage. Let's dump it. Let's get rid of it. Ignore it, and maybe it'll go away, and the rest of the world can buy gold and be happier ever after. Stacey, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. All right, stay tuned for the second half. I'll be speaking with Wolf Richter. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to go to California and talk with Wolf Richter of TestosteronePit.com. Wolf, welcome to the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max, for having me. All right, Wolf, the euro uh, took a tumble this week on suggestion of a rate cut. Uh, what's going on there? Well, uh, I don't think the rate cut is going to make a huge difference. The rates are already so low, and so market's reacting a little bit, but uh, rate cuts themselves are not the, the primary uh, movers here. I think when, the, when and if the ECB decides to, uh, uh, to buy more bonds when, when it does that, that will be a big mover. But the rate cut in itself, uh, if it happens, uh, I don't think has a huge impact. Well, it sounds like they're setting themselves up for more what's called quantitative easing just like the Bank of England will engage in more quantitative easing. The Federal Reserve Bank is already 85 billion or so a month in, in buying of its own bonds. So the entire globe now, what the ECB was lagging, it, so, it sounds like the ECB will join the arms race toward who can self-destruct the fastest by lowering rates and buying lots of, uh, of their own paper. Now, Professor Peter Bowfinger, an economist advisor to Merkel, said this week that over the next 10 years, the rich should give us a portion of their assets, like vacation homes in Spain. So quantitative easing is not enough, Wolf. They, they want to take the, the people's houses, too. Your thoughts? Well, it's certainly an interesting uh, twist. So far in the bailouts, uh, the people who have paid uh, were usually the pensioners, the lower class people who have seen minimum wage cut in Greece, for example. Uh, private sector employees, uh, public sector employees, they all have 
have been paying for these bailouts, and of course, taxpayers in other countries have been paying for them. So now, the, this proposal would actually shift that a little bit and would say, okay, so the lower levels in Greece, the lower levels in in uh, in other countries in Portugal have been paying for this. So let's let's tax the the rich people also, and uh, this is interesting also because they're not talking about a tax on cash, which can move very quickly, but they're talking about a tax on, on assets that cannot move, like real estate. And uh, uh, so this will, be, this will face a lot of resistance, but if it actually does get pushed through, uh, it will be a, a very new development that uh, may have major consequences. Well, it sounds like uh, Mao Zedong. But now Cyprus will have their sovereign gold reserves raided in exchange for a bailout. What happens when they go to Italy? Uh, Italy's got 2,400 tons of, of gold. Uh, will Italy simply lay down and give their gold to Berlin, or will they uh, maybe uh, decide that they don't want to give away their gold? What do you think? I don't think Italy will lay down at all. <laughs> I, don't think, <laughs> I don't think Italy is Cyprus. Italy is a, a large country uh, with a substantial industrial base. Uh, banking is not a huge part of the economy. And uh, the, the part in Italy that is not doing well is, is actually the industrial part. And uh, uh, so I don't think the Italians will, will yield to the pressure of selling the gold. I think right now there's a lot of discussion in Italy whether to stay in the euro or not and uh, whether to, uh, to agree to any more austerity measures or not. So at this level already there's resistance uh, to a, uh, any kind of Troika imposed uh, uh, bailout. So I don't think that Italy will sell its gold to... Uh, but the, the, the pattern that we've seen so far, we reported on this show back when Goldman Sachs and Papandreou and John Paulson colluded and they attacked Greece, destroyed the economy, and then they put Greece's gold up for sale. Uh, in Cyprus, these guys, the hedge funds and the government, colluded to attack the government, and now they have to put up gold uh, and, and to pay off the debts that were imposed on them from these outside marauders and hedge funds and what I call financial terrorists. So in the case of Italy, sure, it's a nice idea. They don't want to give away their 2,400 tons of Berlin, but this is a currency war. Uh, we, they'll stop at nothing. If, Berlin, if Italy doesn't give up their gold, who knows what uh, Berlin, what Germany uh, will, will do to, to get their hands on their, on their gold. Now, let, let's talk about California for a second. You're in California. What do you make of the huge increases in pension contributions to CalPERS that municipalities will now have to pay? It looks like the pension accounts are now being raided. Your thoughts, Wolf? Right. In California, of course, we've got the same problem that people in Greece have, and uh, which is we have huge uh, unfunded pension liabilities, we have uh, deficits, we have uh, every financial issue they have. What we, what we do have, and we have high unemployment in California, uh, what we do have is a pretty sound uh, high-tech economy and, uh, and lots of good functional agriculture. And so now we have to figure out how to pay for the promises we made as a, yeah, it's a, it's a, a deal where uh, votes have been bought over the many years with, with these promises. And so now it's time to pay them. And uh, in our most recent uh, bankruptcy case here in, in uh, uh, the city of uh, uh, Stockton, we uh, discovered that, in fact, the courts are now allowing uh, pensions to be thrown into bankruptcy proceedings for the first time, and uh, which means that when there are bankruptcies in municipalities in California, uh, pensions may have uh, to get a haircut. And that may happen in, one, in, in a number of ways, and one of which is to, to raise contributions. Uh, the other would be to, to lower the benefits. And uh, uh, this hasn't played out yet, but uh, and it, it contravenes a California state law. So we'll have to see how that, that washes out. All right, so we've got quantitative easing in countries where it's a forced transfer of wealth from savers to speculators using artificially low interest rates. Then we had outright confiscation, whether it was MF Global or Cyprus. Now you're saying that the laws and bylaws that govern pensions are being changed so that these speculators can have access to pension money. And of course, there's another problem in the pension business because whether it's CalPERS or Robert Citrone, remember he was managing the Orange County pension, they're open to corruption. CalPERS famously bought into a bad Lehman Brothers paper, even though I, for one, told them it was uh, 
a corrupt, a corrupt situation, but they are obviously in a corrupt institution. So you've got corrupt management, you've got plus a government and corporations that are aligning themselves towards stealing people's wealth. Uh, and at the end of the day, I guess the new governor of California, Jerry Brown, uh, although he's doing seemingly uh, some, making some progress there, the state, is the state gonna get out of the, uh, the fix that it's in? What do you think, Wolf? Well, it depends on the economy. So far, the high-tech industry uh, funded by venture capital has been booming the last couple of years. And uh, agriculture is doing very well in California. Uh, the inland economies are not doing that well. And unemployment is still relatively high in California. So I don't know if, uh, if this economy will stay uh, in a growth mode uh, for long enough to pull California out or whether this was it, the last two or three years, it's gonna slow down again and uh, we'll go back where we were, which is, which is you know, borderline bankruptcy for the state. All so, right, well, I wanna get your comment on uh, whether what we see, what, what appears to be the case of incredible levels of corruption in Wall Street, in Washington, and municipal government. It seems that what we're, seeing is really a two-tiered financial racket where those with access to government uh, authority can take pretty much anything they want, uh, get a nice retirement if that's their goal, while those, uh, the poor people working outside of the government, outside of this, of this um, racket, are really being abused. I mean, it's really a case of racketeering in America, in California, any, any place where central bankers have their way. Is that, am I, am I exaggerating in your opinion, or is this, or is this what, is your, what is your thought on this? Is this really as corrupt as it looks, Wolf? Well, I don't think you're exaggerating. I don't think anyone can exaggerate about the corruption that central banks have engendered. And as we have already seen, uh, uh, through the audits of the Fed uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the amount of corruption going on right in the middle of it. And uh, uh, this is happening everywhere. These central banks are out of uh, democratic controls. They can do whatever they want to, and they don't have to account to, to people. Uh, there is an audit occasionally uh, when, it's, when Congress forces it upon them, and that audit is only partial. So they, they know they're, they're, they're really free to do whatever they want to. And so they have, uh, right now, they're, they're you know, handing out $85 billion a month at the Fed. It goes to uh, uh, 12 banks and uh, they do with it what, whatever they want to. And the idea is that it flows into the economy, and it does flow into the economy at the, at the very high levels. Uh, it does not flow into the economy at the lower levels, and people have not been benefiting from it at all. All right, now, to, to follow up on this corruption between Washington and Wall Street, earlier this week, without much attention, new legislation was passed overturning some of the Stop Trading on Congressional Knowledge, or Stock Act. Uh, so now there are uh, connected staffers in Washington able to trade on inside information. They have the legal right to do so. And this is an open pipeline now between lawmakers in Washington who might be passing laws about drugs or manufacturing or mining or uh, margin requirements or banking regulations, directly a pipeline to uh, Wall Street where insiders in Washington can benefit and profit from trading on inside information. It's canonized in law by this Stock Act that allows this to take place. You're, what do you think? Think of this, Wolf. Effectively, there will be no change. That has always been going on. It's always been a cesspool of corruption, this sort of thing. And uh, the effort to, to write a law to prohibit that, obviously, uh, were short-lived, and so now we're back to where it is allowed, and um, and it will continue to happen. Every every study that looked into this uh, has documented how how insiders in Washington trade on legislative information, and how profitable that is. And uh, obviously, Congress doesn't want to stop it because they benefit from it themselves. Now there seems to be a coordinated effort to corral the population into the stock market, trading at all-time highs, and away from things that might give consumers or citizens uh, maintenance in their purchasing power, such as gold, for example. There was a huge smash of gold recently, but the stock market, even though GDP is down, wages are down, jobs are down, corruption is high, everything you would normally associate with a stock market in trouble 
is completely divorced from the current prices in the stock market. Is this a bubble waiting to burst, Wolf? It is definitely a bubble waiting to burst. And uh, as we have known uh, uh, from, from prior bubbles, so long as the central banks are willing to inflate bubbles, they are generally able to do so. At some point, this becomes impossible. And so now we've, we're hearing lots of uh, discussion at the Fed about stopping the current program uh, of uh, printing $85 billion a month. And when that stops, for sure, the bubble will blow. Now, we have seen. Uh, a shakiness recently in the stock market that we haven't seen in a while. And so I think there's a lot of resistance right now uh, to buying more stocks. The smart money is trying to get out, but the American public hasn't fallen in love with stocks yet and doesn't seem like it's going to. So this will be, a, this will be an interesting scenario to see. And uh, I doubt, I mean, I don't predict stock markets, but I doubt that it can't go much higher from here. It's just, uh, it's just logically uh, difficult to justify. All right, Wolf Richter, we're out of time. Thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max, for having me. All right, and that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank my guest, Wolf Richter of TestosteronePit.com. If you'd like to contact us, you can email us at kaiserreport at rttv.ru or tweet us at Kaiser Report. Until next time, Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.